this time. Why are all landfills built in India? Before we start, don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Now these days we've got very used to manufacturers moving the production of their products from outside their country of origin. Yes, you know who you are, Triumph and KTM. But is that the case of Royal Enfield? Was it a cynical ploy to save money? Or is there a more historical reason that this happened? The story of Royal Enfield is fairly typical of British manufacturers. Originally gunsmiths, they began producing bicycles during the boom of the 1880s. And they set up a factory specifically to produce bicycles in 1883 in Redditch in Worcestershire. In 1902 they produced one of their first motorcycles. This used a Werner engine mounted in a truly bizarre position on the handlebars. But after a few false starts in the early 1900s, in 1910 they produced their first really successful motorcycle with this V-twin that did 2 and 3 quarter horsepower. By 1912 the V-twin had grown to 770 cc's. This engine was built by J.A. Presswich of London and this advanced engine featured a pressurised oil feed and inlet over exhaust valve system. By 1914, Royal Enfield were so confident in their designs that they entered the TT races for the first time with a 347cc V twin. As well as firearms, during the Great War, Royal Enfield produced thousands of bicycles for the British Army, as well as a large number of Jap powered sidecars fitted with Vickers machine guns which was supplied to the Empire of Russia. After the war, the British motorcycle industry boomed. Many ordinary people had grown used to having motorcycles around them during the war, and they began to see them as a practical way to get around. In contrast to today, the V-Twin was not really seen as a sporting motorcycle, but was instead used to haul sidecars around. Sporting machines were generally single cylinder lightweight, and featured side valve, and of course later overhead valves. But as well as heavyweight four strokes, during this period Royal Enfield also produced Villiers powered lightweights such as the ladies model that you can see here. The late 20s and early 30s saw the introduction of this saddle tank and this gave us a motorcycle we would instantly recognise today such as this Model K from the mid 30s. This was of course a big side valve so again was a large touring machine. These Torquay V twins were popular amongst the sidecar users but for the sportsman, it was all about the overhead valve single by the 1930s. The early 30s was a very difficult time in the motorcycle industry. Sales plummeted. This was a time of acquisitions, mergers, and for many, just plain bankruptcy. Royal Enfield plodded on though, although many of their larger V-twins didn't survive the period but singles were really coming to the fore by now. And it was at this time that we saw the introduction of a new sporty single, the Bullet. The original 
had a sloped 500cc engine, as was the fashion of the time. But by the late 30s, the cylinders had been moved into a more usual upright position and gave us a more recognisable bullet profile. But then, of course, World War II got in the way. Warlandville produced a range of side valve and overhead valve dispatch rider machines, as well as their famous Flying Flea Lightweight. This little machine was designed to be dropped by parachute for use by airborne forces. With the war over, Royal Enfield came back with a range of single cylinder machines. Initially these were quite humdrum, but in 48 they showed an organ bullet with an aluminium sporty head and swinging arm suspension. This was very unusual at the time and only really been seen on sporty and racing machines before then. But Royal Enfield were heavily invested in trials and then realised the huge advantage the rear suspension would give them. Common thinking at the time was that rigid rear ends gave the rider better feel as he was riding over rough ground. Royal Enfields with their suspension however proved that this was complete nonsense and the machine would go on to be the most successful heavyweight trials machine of all time. Like everyone else, Royal Enfield would develop a parallel twin to put in their nice swinging arm chassis. Initially this was a 500, but later they would create a 700cc engine by effectively using the cylinders from two bullets, creating the Meteor and the 500cc Meteor Miner to run alongside it. Perhaps slightly bizarrely, the big twin would be sold in the USA as an Indian. Now all this is all very well, you might ask. What on earth has this got to do with production in India? Well hang on, because we're about to get there. Royal Enfield's bullet has a number of virtues. Not least of these is simple maintenance and robustness. Now these virtues did not go unnoticed by the Indian government. They were looking for a machine to patrol the border between India and Pakistan and the trial success of the bullet seemed to make it an ideal machine for that job. So successful was this that in 1957 Royal Enfield opened a factory in Madras, India what is today called Chennai, to produce the 1957 model 350 bullet for the Indian government and also for the local civilian market. Royal Enfield at Redditch saw itself as a forward-looking modern company. They tried machines with dolphin fairings and went for unit construction and five-speed gearboxes for their 250 sporting machines. When these unit construction bikes proved popular, Royal Enfield fairly logically thought they'd apply this to the bullet and developed a unit construction version of the 350 bullet. And this machine would also be available with such novelties as a full fairing. But this was the era of the calf racer and the tunnel boy. Royal Enfield tried to meet this market by developing ever sporting models such as their tiny Continental GT250 Sportster as well as bigger more powerful parallel twins leading in the 1960s to Royal Enfield's Interceptor 750. But for the British motorcycle industry Disaster was on the horizon. Cheap cars had encroached on the motorcycles market. And by the early 60s, sales had slumped badly. And of course, then came Honda. The Japanese finished off what was left of the British industry. Royal Enfield tried to respond. They developed a racing machine with the assistance of Jeff Duke, as well as a lightweight single overhead cam, single cylinder machine. In addition, there came the Interceptor 2. This had true wet sump lubrication and was probably the most advanced parallel twin that the early British bike industry actually produced. But by the time this stunning twin appeared, the reddish factory was long gone. Manganese bronze holdings had taken over and sold the factory off 
proper development, it seems the land was worth more than the company itself. And the interceptor, good as it was, wasn't enough to save the company. And in 1970, it was all over. It seemed that Royal Enfield was just a bit too small to survive in the competitive market of the era. But of course, all was not lost. ये बुलेट मेरी जान मंजिलों का निशा ये बुलेट मेरी जान मंजिलों का निशा एनफील्ड बुलेट गजब की सवारी कोसेवर इन चेन्नई प्रोडक्शन ऑफ़ द 57 बुलेट कंटिन्यूड द कंपनी अभी गेटिंग ऑन एंड इट सेपरेटेड अवे फ्रॉम द मेन कंपनी इन द मिड 60स in India, these hand-built machines were seen as prestige items. So successful were they. They even began to import machines back into Britain in the 1970s. And for a time, they even tried to purchase the Meriden factory when Triumph had gone under. But they were outbid by Bloor, who would of course build houses on the side. But in the 1980s, the company would establish an official importer into the UK and would develop models specifically for the UK and European markets. Ironically, they were selling a British designed motorcycle back into Britain. And quirky and niche, by this point, a 350 bullet may have been, but it had nevertheless had its fans, and the sales were fairly successful. We first encountered the machines on our 2008 trip to India. So impressed were we that we bought a 350 bullet when we got back and mounted a sidecar on it. Our 17 horsepower 350 doesn't seem a lot for sidecar work, but those long shock engines are mighty talky and the machine did a much better job than you might expect. But of course nothing lasts forever. Emission regulations meant that the old bullet was untenable for sale in Europe, so a new unit construction 500cc unit replaced it. This included five speeds and fuel injection, and was available in a range of types. There was a trials replica, as well as classic and standard bullet models. And then Royal Enfield did something completely unexpected, and they developed an all new model, the first for decades. And this was the Himalayan 410. A true travel adventure bike, a machine to go anywhere, a usable, relatively lightweight, on off road motorcycle. And as the name suggests, this was a machine designed to tackle the rugged Himalayan roads. Top end performance was modest, but the long stroke engine was Royal Enfield torquey, and there was five speeds, and of course fuel injection, even ABS in Europe. And as the millennium progressed, Royal Enfield came around full circle. They purchased English chassis designers Harris Engineering and established a new design centre in Britain. And now some of the design work on the new machines, such as the 650, Continental and Interceptors, is done on these shores. So, was Royal Enfield's move to India something for cash grab? I'd have to say no. Ultimately, they were victims of circumstance. Circumstances for which they have survived. So if Enfield are anything, they are survivors. And for that, I salute them. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching. So until next time, ride safely.